Well, my compliments to the five speakers who preceded me. These were really, really impressive. If I could be uh, one-tenth as compelling, I will have done my job. In yesterday's session, many of the speakers referred to new forms of authoritarianism that have emerged in recent years, recent decades. Someone mentioned modern dictatorship, subtle dictatorship, elected autocracies, to quote Alejandro Toledo. Luke and Wei and I just published a book that tries to put a name to this new regime type. As all of you know, the last 30 years saw an unprecedented wave of political change. Dictatorships collapsed throughout Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, much of Asia, and now parts of the Middle East. Elections spread across the globe. But not all transitions lead to democracy. That was one of the great myths of the last two decades. In fact, many transitions gave rise and continue to give rise to competitive authoritarianism, regimes in which multi-party elections exist and are meaningful, but systematic government abuse skews the playing field against the opposition. Prominent examples include Mexico under the PRI, Peru under Alberto Fukimori, Serbia under Milosevic, uh, Russia under Yeltsin and Putin, and Venezuela under Hugo Chavez. But dozens of other competitive authoritarian regimes have also emerged in the last couple of decades in countries as diverse as Armenia, Albania, Croatia, Belarus, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Gabon, Cameroon, Georgia, Kenya, Malaysia, Mozambique, Nigeria, Ecuador, Romania, Senegal, Taiwan, Ukraine, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, to name a few. Now, unlike traditional dictatorships, competitive authoritarian regimes are competitive. Opposition parties exist, they're legal, they're above ground, and they use democratic institutions to contest, often vigorously, for power. Incumbents really have to sweat it out on election day. Once in a while, they even lose elections. So democratic institutions aren't just a facade. This is not Egypt under Mubarak. But what distinguishes competitive authoritarianism from democracy is that competition is unfair. Civil liberties are often violated. Journalists and opposition activists are harassed. They're arrested. They're exiled. They're occasionally killed. And elections are marred by intimidation, by media bias, and occasionally by fraud. And crucially, crucially, the political playing field is uneven. Incumbents massively abuse state resources, raiding the public treasury, and systematically deploying state institutions as weapons against the opposition. So soldiers, police, bureaucrats work actively for the governing party. Intelligence agencies spy on the opposition. Tax authorities investigate and punish, often systematically, businesses that finance the opposition, and the courts are used to convict newspaper editors and journalists of libel. As a result, opposition forces are denied access to two absolutely essential things, finance and the media. Incumbents outspend their opponents by 20, 30, even 50 to 1, and pro-government forces control most, if not all, major broadcast media. There may be independent newspapers and magazines, but what really counts is radio and television. And those things, for the most part, are in the hands of pro-government allies. So this is not just ordinary, run-of-the-mill incumbent advantage. It's an advantage that's so one-sided and so excessive that it seriously undermines the opposition's ability to compete. As Mexican analyst Jorge Castaneda put it, it's like a soccer match where the goalposts are of different lengths and different heights, and where one team has 11 players plus the referee, and the other team has a mere six or seven players. Now, the rise of competitive authoritarianism is very much a post-Cold War phenomenon. The collapse of the Soviet Union, the rising power of the West in the 1990s, an unprecedented Western democracy promotion raised the cost of outright dictatorship and created very strong incentives for developing countries to adopt formal democratic institutions, particularly elections. Suddenly, in the 1990s and 2000s, it became a lot harder to sustain a full-scale autocracy. You could do it if you were China, you could do it if you were Saudi Arabia, but if you were a poor peripheral country like Malawi, like Haiti, Albania, Cambodia, the cost of outright dictatorship grew very, very high. But at the same time, as all of you know, there were real limits to this international democratizing pressure. International community insisted that governments tolerate opposition, that they hold elections, but beyond that, the level of external scrutiny was pretty low. So governments learned pretty quickly that they could get away with quite a bit of abuse. They couldn't ban the opposition in the private media, but they could still bully them and they could still buy them off. 
They couldn't cancel elections, but they could still skew the playing field and in many cases, steal a few votes here and there. So the international bar was raised after 1990, but it was raised to the level of elections, not to the level of democracy. And what that meant was that unless there was a strong domestic push from democracy, rooted in a robust civil society, the collapse of dictatorship very often gave rise not to democracy, but to competitive authoritarianism. This was particularly true in the former Soviet Union and in Africa, where civil societies were especially weak. Competitive authoritarian regimes proliferated in the post-Cold War era. When Gorbachev came to power in the Soviet Union in 1985, there were seven or eight of them in the world. A decade later, mid-1990s, there were nearly 40. Among developing countries today, there are about as many competitive authoritarian regimes as there are democracies. Now, compared to other forms of, of authoritarianism, competitive authoritarianism is fairly benign. Malawi is much freer today than it was under Banda. Fujimori's Peru pales next to Pinochet's Chile. And Putin's Russia is still hardly the Soviet Union. But the problem with competitive authoritarianism is that it slips under international radar screens. Because there are regular multi-party elections, because there are fewer massive human rights violations, competitive authoritarian regimes rarely face heavy international scrutiny. In fact, the international community generally treated countries like Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, Zambia, Malawi, Tanzania as new democracies in the 1990s. But they were not new democracies. They were never new democracies. And the proof lies in the fact that opposition forces almost never won elections. Take Southern Africa, for example. Namibia, Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia were all widely considered new democracies in the 1990s. But with the exception of founding elections in Zambia and Malawi nearly 20 years ago, how many elections have incumbents lost in those four countries? The answer is none. Since 1994, incumbents are undefeated in all four countries, winning 14 consecutive presidential elections. Throw in Botswana, another mythical democracy, and you have 18 out of 18 presidential elections in the last 20 years. In democracies, incumbents don't win 18 out of 18 elections. But the deeper problem with giving competitive authoritarian regimes a free pass is that many of them eventually reconsolidate into full-scale authoritarianism. In the mid-1990s, Belarus and Russia were relatively benign competitive authoritarian regimes. Now, today, both of them are much closer to full-scale dictatorship. 15 or 20 years ago, Cambodia, Mozambique, Cameroon were fairly competitive regimes. Today, ruling parties have reestablished hegemony. Now, there are basically three paths out of competitive authoritarianism. In terms of democracy, the optimal path is that in which the regime is defeated by a strong domestic opposition, either via elections, like in Ghana, like in Taiwan, like in Mexico, or via sustained protest, like in Serbia. Transitions that are driven by a robust opposition usually do result in democracy. Unfortunately, though, that sort of transition is fairly uncommon because in today's competitive authoritarian regimes, civic and opposition forces are pretty weak. Unfortunately, there are not many Polands or South Africans left. Uh, they, uh, the bases for robust opposition movements in countries like Cambodia, Russia, Tanzania are weak, are pretty non-existent. A more common source of change in competitive authoritarian regimes is collapse from within. Most competitive authoritarian regimes are pretty weak. Ruling parties are weak. The state's coercive apparatus is weak. And when states and ruling parties are weak, regimes are often pretty vulnerable to crisis. Faced with a viable opposition candidate, faced with a wave of protest in the capital, things very quickly unravel. The ruling party splits. Top government officials defect to the opposition. The army and police refuse to crack down on protest. The president is forced to flee. We saw this in Albania. We saw it in Haiti, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, Madagascar, Ukraine, among other countries. These transitions, driven by weakness, often look pretty spectacular. They may even get labeled democratic revolutions, but they're not revolutions, and they often do not bring democracy. They're what we call, what Luke and Wei and I call, rotten door transitions, transitions in which protesters essentially knock down a rotten door in a context of a weak state, weak political parties, and a weak civil society. Those are not conditions under which democracy is likely to take hold. In fact, rotten door transitions 
often fail to bring about much institutional change at all. And they often bring to power politicians who only very recently defected from the old regime. So you get successor governments made up of the old elite playing by many of the old rules of the game. And more often than not, the result of that is another round of competitive authoritarianism. We saw that in Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, Malawi, Zambia, Madagascar, and other places. A third way out of competitive authoritarianism is through strong external pressure. In some cases, particularly in Eastern Europe, close international monitoring and effective use of conditionality raised the cost of fraud and abuse so much that autocrats ultimately opted to seize power, or to cede power, excuse me, rather than crack down in the face of a strong opposition challenge. We saw that in Croatia, in Romania, in Slovakia, Albania, Guyana, Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua in 1990. What these cases have in common is extensive economic, political, technocratic communication and civil society ties to Europe or the United States. This is what Luke and Wei and I call international linkage. Where linkage is extensive, the cost of abuse is higher because a greater number of domestic, political, and economic actors have a stake in maintaining their country's international standing. It is in places like Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Croatia, Slovakia, Romania, where politicians, technocrats, business people, and even voters believe they have a lot to lose from international isolation. It's there that we're, where external democratizing pressure has the greatest impact. In fact, among the 11 high linkage cases that we examine in our book, not a single competitive authoritarian regime survived the post-Cold War period. All of them died. By contrast, in Africa, the former Soviet Union, and in much of Asia, where ties to the West are weaker or are more uneven, the impact of external pressure is much weaker, and competitive authoritarianism has been much more robust. Now that poses, I think, a dilemma for international human rights and democracy promoters. Democracy promotion appears to work best where linkage to the West is extensive. And that suggests, at least to me, that long-term policies of building ties, like the EU did in Eastern Europe, have some real value. But the international response to authoritarianism is usually to isolate, to suspend assistance, to exclude from international organizations, to apply sanctions, Zimbabwe, Burma, Iran. These policies over the long haul reduce linkage, which may ultimately limit the effectiveness of external pressure. The regimes that exist today in Mozambique, in Georgia, in Nigeria, in Malaysia, are much, much preferable to the military or single party dictatorships that were so widespread during the Cold War era. But we shouldn't be satisfied with electoral regimes in which the ruling party almost never loses. Real democracy requires a level playing field. And dealing with an uneven playing field is a major new challenge for democracy promoters across the world. And I think it's going to be a big issue in the coming years in the Middle East. The Middle East, as all of you know, is the last major bastion of outright dictatorship in the world. All of us hope that these dictatorships, when they fall, will be replaced by democracies. But I think it's much more likely that we'll see the emergence of a variety of competitive authoritarian regimes in the region. I'll stop there.